Why? You can tell I'm not a doctor, so there's no doctor in the house where I live. <laughs> do, you, do you have a transmitter on? Yes, sir. Is that right? Like? This one. Okay, can you speak up a little bit and see if that's... Hello? Hello? Mm -hmm. It might be too far from you. Yeah. No. Hello? Is that better? Hello? Hello? Sexual and labor exploitation is a human rights abuse, the lowest, most profitable of criminal acts, and as much a challenge to healthy societal morals and well-being as slavery was 150 years ago. In fact, it is modern slavery. To think that in this land of the home and the free and the brave, that this depravity exists and that it poses a public health risk and political challenge would make most Americans incredulous. Our president is convinced it's a special evil. In fact, in his recent comments about the state of terrorism to the UN body, he included seven paragraphs on this tragedy of the human soul. By treating bodies as sexual merchandise to be traded, used, discarded, our own country must face the demand feature of this criminal business and face that since the 90s, we can estimate as many as 20,000 women and children yearly have been sold into this country by various means. Here they stay to be transported back and forth, mostly inside their ethnic groups, to be merchandised in a variety of ways through prostitution, sex trafficking, sex tourism, the mail order bride trade, pornography, and labor. We're eager today to, to alert you to these issues, recruit you, advise you, hear your stories and answer your questions. But most of all, we're here to implore you to help us. Help us find traffic victims trapped here in the U.S. You may be the only persons victims see who can save them out of their hell. You have the power to be alone with them, to order their handlers, pimps, owners out of your presence while you treat them. And you may be the only ones to offer rescue and restoration to their lives who are unimaginably damaged. Today, I'm delighted to bring you a global history and academic perspective from someone we admire in Washington who pioneered the problem, Dr. Laura Letterer, who I began to know this problem from in the 90s, uh, started in Minnesota and then went to Harvard and ended up at Johns Hopkins Sice with this. And now she serves the uh, global secretary at the, uh, as a senior advisor at the State Department. She knows the full breadth of this problem and can give you that perspective. Uh, then I'll turn it over to Steve Wagner, who's on the front lines of the HHAS campaign to which I consult about the domestic trafficking dilemma we have right here. And he'll tell you HHS present plans and efforts in building local task force in various key cities uh, across this country. And what we found to date. After their remarks, I'll encourage you to ask questions. I'm sure you're gonna note some all, all along the way. And so we can build an open dialogue to build that knowledge that we find missing uh, and how the medical profession faced the problems of domestic violence rape years ago in reporting and rescuing, and how we can learn from that experience in designing <coughs> protocols that work today. So, Dr. Laura Lutter. Well, thank you, Claudia. And I want to thank also the American Medical Association National Advisory Council on Violence, and especially Dr. Uh, Art uh, Esther, Est Elster and uh, Dr. David McCollum for this opportunity to discuss the public and private health implications of human trafficking. Because for a long time, we've recognized the human rights aspect of, of uh, trafficking and the law enforcement issues involved. But we've really been remiss in identifying the serious private and public health implications. 
Victims of trafficking often endure brutal conditions that result in physical, sexual, and psychological trauma. The health risks of trafficking in persons include HIV AIDS, of course, but also many other sexually transmitted diseases, pelvic inflammatory disease, hepatitis, TB, and other serious communicable diseases. In sex trafficking, they can also include unwanted pregnancy, forced abortion, or abortion-related complications, rape and other violence such as battery and assault, and finally substance abuse um, such as alcohol or drug addiction. These are very common in human trafficking because long-standing physical and psychological abuse usually need to be numbed in some way in order to be endured. The health implications of sex trafficking um, extend not only to its victims but also to customers and sex tourists and beyond them to the general public as well because those who frequent brothels and can become carriers and transmitters of, of serious diseases and in this modern day form of slavery as Claudia has called it where people are being moved vast distances around the globe to do someone else's bidding for someone else's gain, the epidemics are moving with them. In order to understand the vulnerability and the violence um, to uh, a person who is trafficked, I want to tell you first the story of someone who is trafficked because it illustrates the health impact of trafficking on a human being. So this is the story of Rosa, and this story was read into the state, uh, the um, federal senate and the house of representatives when we were debating um, uh, the uh, Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000. Um, because uh, she was a child and because she was too sick to tell her own story. Um, she was trafficked from Mexico to the United States when she was 13. She was waiting tables in a restaurant in a small village in Veracruz, Mexico, when she was approached by an acquaintance of the family who told her, you know, you can make 10 times more money doing what you're doing here in Mexico across the border in Texas. And you can send money home to your family. You'll have a new life. If you don't like the job that we get you, we'll find you a new one. If you get homesick, we'll send you back home. We have the ability to find you the job and get you the papers and get you across the borders. And so it's really a win-win situation. Now, Rosa was young and hopeful, and she went home that night, and she asked her parents about this, and her parents forbade her. They said she could not go because they knew the dangers. But she was young, and she uh, secretly against her parents and her friends warnings accepted their offer and she was told to go to the main hotel on Friday evening and when she got there a car was waiting with several other young girls in it from several other villages in the state of Veracruz who had been recruited and they drove in this car as far as they could into the Mexican desert toward the American uh, uh, border and there they met up with several other young uh, women and girls who'd been recruited from other um, uh, states in Mexico and on the ground were backpacks and water bottles and they were told to put on the backpacks and put on the water bottles and then they walked. They walked four days and they four nights through the desert, through the Rio Grande and into a small village, um, brown, uh, small town, Brownsville, Texas, which is on the border of uh, um, Mexico and the United States. And there they were picked up by a white van and Rosa said that um, 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 the abuse that she endured began there and for, forever after that, whenever she saw a white van, she uh, experienced flashbacks and, and uh, um, trauma because um, they, were, they were apparently uh, beaten and held in that van uh, while they were headed off toward, um, toward Florida. They drove through Louisiana and uh, into a rural area in Florida where they were dropped off in front of a series of trailers. And there, a big burly man accepted them and the van drove off and the, the man uh, told all, all the young women and girls that they had been purchased and uh, that they were in a brothel and that they would have to buy their freedom by sexually servicing men. Now, Rosa was young. She was a virgin. She was Catholic. She knew that what they were telling her was a sin and so she refused. She said, I was told I would have a restaurant job. I want the restaurant job. And they said, there is no restaurant job, just this. This is what you get. And when she refused, she was taken to one of the trailers. She was gang raped by some of the men to induct her into the business. And she was left there for three days and three nights without uh, food and water. And she said she realized that if she didn't succumb, she would, she would die there. And so she did, she succumbed. And for the next six months, she was a prisoner. And she was forced to service 10 or more men a day. On weekends, it was as many as 20 to 30. The men bought a ticket, which was a condom, for $20, but oftentimes they didn't use it. Rosa was very beautiful, and she was very much in demand. Twice she was impregnated, twice she was uh, forced to have abortions, and twice she was back in the brothel the next day. 
She was beaten if she refused a customer's demand. She was guarded 24 hours a day, even when she went to the bathroom. She was passed around at private parties and on weekends um, when the, the, the traffickers had private parties. Um, once she and a couple of other girls tried to escape and they were caught and, and the entire uh, uh, crew of young women and girls were assembled and the ones that had tried to escape were pistol whipped around the face in front of everybody to deter everyone from escaping. Shortly after the second abortion and this beating, Rosa said she started to feel crazy like she was not inside herself. And in order to keep her functioning, when she complained, they gave her drugs, they gave her alcohol to, to numb the pain. Six months later, she was rescued when one of the other young women jumped out of a second story window um, and ran to a neighbor's house from one of these private parties. The neighbor called the police, the police called the INS, and they set up a sting operation. They went in pretending to be customers, and, um, and then they did a raid, and they rescued the uh, about 40, 40, 45 uh, young women and children and about 14 traffickers. Um, a medical do a doctor examined Re Rosa at this time. She had several STDs. She had broken bones that hadn't healed properly from the beatings. She had pelvic inflammatory disease. She had scar tissue from the forced abortions. She was addicted to drugs and alcohol, and she was uh, suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome, including nightmares, flashbacks, depression, suicidal tendencies. In short, she was physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually broken. And to make matters worse, when, this first case, when we first came up upon this case, we didn't have a Trafficking Victims Protection Act. We didn't have a law. And instead of really rescuing Rosa, she, she and the other uh, young women and children were rounded up and, and held in a jail along with the traffickers because we thought they were, were uh, criminals. We simply didn't have a victim-centered approach to trafficking, and we didn't know how to handle the case. Now, a few uh, days later, when um, the police realized we've got something a little different here, and they brought in interpreters, and they started to hear the stories of these young women and children, they realized we've got victims here, and then we've got traffickers over here. And they were separated, and they were taken to a battered wives shelter. And there they were told, shh, pretend you're a battered wife, because we have a mandate from the federal government to serve spousal abuse. And so um, you can stay here as long as you know, people think that's what you are. And so for a year and a half, Rosa and uh, the other young women and children were in a battered wives shelter, which at the time was the best we could do. But they never did get treatment, um, uh, physical and um, um, psychological treatment, for uh, the, 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 um, the, the, the symptoms and the trauma that they had been, been through. Now, if you take Rosa's story and you multiply it by hundreds of thousands, in fact, by millions, you'll get an idea of what's going on globally and, and, and then in, in our um, country. Uh, the CIA estimates that it's about 600,000 to 800,000 women and children who are trafficked per year um, uh, uh, globally, and about 17 to 20,000 that are trafficked into this country per year. And um, I'm arguing now for a cumulative number because most of those are not being rescued and restored, which uh, Steve is going to talk to you about a little more. So most of those over the past decade, those who've been trafficked, are still in trafficking situations. And so cumulatively, the numbers are in the millions. <coughs> Wherever I go around the world, I talk with victims, and I'm struck by the individualized horror of the each girl's story. In other words, how she was recruited, how exploited, how abused, how finally rescued. And yet, at the same time, there are so astounding similarities um, between all of these victims. The slick tricks that are used to lure and deceive them, the brutality and the misery that they endure, the enormous sophistication uh, and the organization of traffickers across national, across ethnic, across religious, across language, across geographic barriers, the collusion of some public uh, officials, because you cannot move thousands of people across borders without some kind of, of, of collusion, the difficulty of raids and rescues, because this is a hidden underground criminal activity, and the great unmet needs of the victims, the very long time it takes to heal, and the enormous resources that it takes to combat the problem, both in terms of the law enforcement and then in terms of the public health uh, and, and human rights uh, issues. Now, six years ago, 
1998, the realization that this was a growing problem around the world and that was largely unaddressed led to the formation of a uh, bipartisan, broad-based coalition of women's rights organizations, children's <laughs> rights organizations, um, human rights organizations, uh, labor groups, and others who were interested in doing something about trafficking. It included Republicans and Democrats. It, it included people from right to left. And um, together, they helped to draft and pass the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000. This is a, a law that is unique in the world, and so I'm just going to talk just very briefly about it to give you a, a little background. It provides a comprehensive approach to the elimination of trafficking in persons through a three-pronged strategy, prevention, prosecution, and protection and services. And um, it does a number of things I just want to mention four. First, it broadened the definition of trafficking. Um, so that it included that whole pipeline of activity from recruiter to transporter, buyer, seller, harborer, the, the uh, people who own the brothels or who own the, the, uh, um, the um, corporation or the, the um, garment factory, um, and then the kingpins at the top who are, who are creaming money off the top. And that's important because people said to us when we first started this work, why not just use the rape laws or why not just use the kidnapping laws? But we couldn't do that because that just got to that one rapist or that one kidnapper. This is a phenomenon unlike any other phenomenon, and so we needed to get to that whole pipeline of activity. Second, it increased penalties from 20 years to life. We had in the United States a law, uh, a transportation law that was a tr the old Mann Act, transportation across borders, that had been um, uh, amended very quickly to, but the, the penalty was a maximum five years. And um, so when, when we passed the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, we made the penalties 20 years to life. That's commensurate with forcible sexual assault, and uh, it also sends a message to human traffickers that we take this as seriously as we take drug trafficking and arms trafficking. Third, it has a victim-centered approach. And at the time that the United States was passing this law, this was also unique in the world. Um, we, we, we designed a T visa for victims um, so that they could stay in the United States um, um, on a temporary residency visa if they cooperate with law enforcement authorities in helping us to catch traffickers, to apprehend them, to arrest them, to prosecute them, and to convict them. And, um, and then they can also uh, apply for permanent residency when that three-year um, term is up. And fourth, it appropriated $60 million in resources that first year, which is about quadrupled now, so that we could address trafficking because we all know that, that a law without resources is about as good as the paper it's, it's written on. And, and um, both the President and Congress are very committed to this issue, and so I think we will see a continuation of, of those resources. And I know that, that uh, Steve is going to talk to you more about um, what Health and Human Services is doing with its resources, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I want to also say that the administration, since the law passed, has done a very uh, a great deal to implement the law. Two years ago, President Bush um, created a President's Interagency Task Force on Trafficking. It's a cabinet-level task force. It's about to meet <laughs> again for its third time. It in, it's chaired by my boss, Condoleezza Rice, the Secretary of State, and then uh, is, includes the uh, Attorney General, the, the Secretary of the Health and Human Services, Secretary of Labor, um, uh, the USAID Administrator, um, CIA Director, and um, a number of other of the agencies that play a vital role in addressing trafficking. And this is important because it sends a, a, the, a message about the political will of this country to address this issue. And that political will can stream down into each agency. Um, the law also mandated a new office to combat and monitor trafficking in persons, and the office does a number of things. I only want to touch on these um, briefly because they don't have a, a whole lot to do with, with what we're, we're discussing here, but um, they do give you a background on what the diplomatic efforts that the U.S. is, um, is making uh, to address trafficking. First, um, the, the office does, um, through high-level meetings with ambassadors and other senior policy officials, attempt to uh, um, encourage and urge 
countries to address their trafficking problems because this is a transnational problem and those who are coming to our um, uh, country here are coming from somewhere else. The CIA is estimating a third, a third, and a third. One third from Russia, the newly independent states, Eastern Europe. One third from South America, Central America, and Mexico up um, through the uh, Mexican-American border. And one third Southeast Asia, um, uh, um, South Asia, and, 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 and China. Um, across the Pacific um, uh, into California or into Canada and then down uh, through there. So we, we have diplomatic efforts um, with each of these countries. Um, and the office produces a trafficking in persons report each year which rates and assesses um, each of the countries and in terms of how much they're doing to um, address um, their, their trafficking problem and um, uh, rates them tier one, tier two, tier three, and we can talk a little bit more about, about how that works uh, later. I think we need to, um, uh, as I'm addressing all of you, I, I, we need to um, insert some of the health implications into our um, assessment of what countries are doing, and I, I don't think that is, is really there in a, a, a good way, so you may be able to help us with, with that. Um, and finally, in uh, February of 2003, President Bush signed a national security presidential directive on trafficking, the first ever of its kind. Um, and in it, he called on the U.S. government agencies to collaborate and to coordinate uh, their plans, to, to, to draw up strategic plans and to collaborate and coordinate on those strategic plans. And most important, he announced a policy shift for this country in terms of trafficking. He linked prostitution and trafficking and stated that, that in terms of sex trafficking, the government believes that prostitution is inherently harmful to men, women, and children, and that because prostitution fuels human trafficking, we're opposed to legalizing it and to considering it a legitimate form of work. And we can get into what that means for on the ground for the, the work that we're doing. Um, as the U.S. has geared up on, on, on this, other countries have also been uh, stepping up to the plate, and yet worldwide we are seeing that the trafficking is continued, continuing. Trafficking is going largely unpub unpunished. Trafficking victims are largely unrescued and unrestored, and the problem looms. And for this reason, the U.S. is partnering with NGOs and other non-profit uh, non and non-governmental organizations and with service providers in order, to, uh, in order to better attack this problem. Governments can do a lot of things well. We can pass laws, we can um, adopt new policies, we can prepare national education campaigns to raise awareness um, at home and in communities. We can utilize taxpayer resources to assist groups in providing services, but this isn't really enough. And as Steve is going to talk with you a little bit more, there are some things that, that, that the, health, the service providers, health providers are always going to do, to, to do best. And in terms of the, um, the health implications of, of, of uh, trafficking victims, oftentimes the first line of contact, and sometimes the only line of contact between trafficking victims and the mainstream world is the healthcare professional. A number of our recent trafficking cases have come to us from doctors, alert doctors, nurses, emergency service providers, and other healthcare professionals who took the time to, as uh, Steve's slogan is, look beneath the surface and to ask questions and to ferret out what the real nature of the health problem was confronting the young person that was in front of them. And so um, I uh, want to echo what, what Claudia said um, and um, um, uh, urge a partnership between the U.S. government and between the American Medical Association and, and um, the health professionals. I think our tasks are threefold. One, we have to develop policies and programs to address the medical and health implications of trafficking in persons. Two, we have to train health professionals, the whole health sector, train them up so that they can identify trafficking victims when they come in contact with them. And three, we need to integrate rescue and a rescue component into what is the present palliative um, uh, care approach. And so I'm looking forward, very much looking forward to the conversation and very much looking forward to a partnership um, between the American Medical Association and the U.S. government and I'll look forward to, uh, to talking with you more.
David, can I uh, stand over here without being off camera? Since there's our little... Is the mic working? <clears throat> Dave and Art, we really appreciate the opportunity to be here. This is more than uh, a casual meeting, another presentation about trafficking. It really is an extremely important event for the reasons that Laura mentioned uh, and for reasons that I hope will become clear through the presentation. Collaborating with the AMA the medical profession is, is, I think, one of the keys to our successful addressing of this, uh, this terrible, uh, terrible problem. To sort of begin with, with my conclusion, in case uh, any of you doze off during the presentation, Congress set a magnificent table, a banquet, if you will, for victims of human trafficking. Immigration relief, services, the premise was that a victim of human trafficking should be allowed to rebuild their lives while staying here in the United States. It's the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. It's a victim-centered approach. It isn't arrest the traffickers and throw away the key act, although that's an important outcome, I hope, of, of all that we do. And so we have this, this tremendous mechanism, I think, in place to help these tremendously traumatized individuals. And what we've discovered since the act was passed, victims will not come forward. It strikes me every day I work in this field that this is so analogous to domestic violence, say, 30 years ago, or child abuse today. The victims will not self-report, so we have to go out and find them. And the campaign that HHS launched is uh, undertaken for that purpose. And the essence of our strategy is that there is a group of intermediaries individuals and organizations that are coming in contact with victims on a daily basis and they just don't know it they just don't realize it and so while law enforcement's actions will always be important in this area if we can get all of these intermediaries to understand the phenomenon of human trafficking to know how to recognize a victim to know what to do when they find a victim of human trafficking we can get the numbers up to where they they should be because the numbers today of victims that have been liberated are wholly inadequate. So, I'm so glad Laura gave you what the face of human trafficking really is in the case of Rosa, because it's a terrible thing to have to talk about. It is modern day slavery and it's occurring in the United States. The crime of trafficking is a bit of a misnomer because it has nothing to do with the physical movement of people. The crime of trafficking is exploitation. It is forcing somebody to do something against their will. In the case of adults, you force somebody to do something through force, fraud, or coercion. In the case of minors involved in commercial sex, you don't need that, that element. But in general, because a minor cannot agree to engage in commercial sex. So anyone under the age of 18 involved in commercial sex is a victim of trafficking, full stop. But in general, traffickers are using force, fraud, and coercion. We have to show these elements in order to make the, the case against them. And um, this, this law is the first recognition in federal statute of the power of psychological coercion. Our victims don't need to be bound, kept under lock and key. As you'll hear so often, they are allowed to interact with society at large. Because what the law recognizes is psychological coercion, the bonds of fear. And mostly, traffickers are using fear to keep their victims in place. This is today the second largest criminal enterprise in terms of profitability after drugs, roughly tied with the arms trade internationally big bucks. This is principally an economic crime. <clears throat> I think one has to be a sadist to, to be a trafficker, but they are not doing this in order to gratify that sadism. They are doing it to make money. And as you see, it is also the fastest growing criminal enterprise today. The intelligence community is telling us that there are somewhere between 600 and 800,000 victims trafficked internationally. 
and they've done their best to estimate the flow of victims into the United States. So the latest estimate is 14.5 to 18.5 thousand victims per year coming into the United States. The problem with that estimate is that the methodology relies somewhat on cases that have been detected. So it's kind of an extrapolation of the cases that we know about. I'm, I'm reminded that when Henry Kemp wrote in 1962 about the battered child, he thought that there might be, what, 10,000 cases a year of physical child abuse. My office reported a couple weeks ago the figures for 2003 were 900,000. I don't have a fear that this is an underestimation of the extent of the problem. We have no idea how many victims there are in the United States today. A year ago, a reporter by the name of Peter Landesman wrote a fabulous article in the New York Times Magazine, and he was pilloried for having the temerity to say there are probably 50,000 victims in the United States. I think that's actually an extremely conservative estimate, but we don't know how many victims there are today, and that only includes foreign victims. You heard me say that any kid under the age of 18 who is involved in commercial sex is the victim of trafficking. Doesn't matter where that kid is from. The Justice Department just recently had its first case of using the Trafficking Victim Protection Act to prosecute a pimp for the trafficking of an American kid, and it happened to be in, in Washington, D.C. Personally, I hope to see a lot more of this, but on the services side, we have to be mindful that as we look for foreign victims, we're going to be finding a lot of domestic victims of trafficking also. These, those um, numbers are not included in these estimates. <clears throat> as you heard Laura say, a plurality of our victims are coming from East Asia, followed by Latin America. Eastern Europe is the fastest growing source region for victims of trafficking. The Act recognizes two types of exploitation, commercial sex, which includes, I mean, when you think of the commercial sex industry, it includes pornography, <coughs> massage parlors, escort services, exotic dancing. On the labor side, it's migrant farm labor, it's sweatshop factories, it's construction, service industry jobs like restaurants and janitorial services, and domestic household servitude. We found victims in all of these arenas. <clears throat> commercial sex trafficking means the, uh, the sexual exploitation of, of children or an adult where the elements of force, fraud, or coercion can be, can be shown. In other words, there are two legal standards for uh, proving sex trafficking. And um, very often, uh, as you heard in the case of Rosa, the victims are coming here unaware that they're going to be forced into uh, commercial sex, prostitution. <clears throat> As best we can figure, a little over half involve women and girls in commercial sex. This is more of an international picture, but we think, so far as we know, that the case is similar uh, in the United States. So a little less than half of the victims are in situations of uh, labor exploitation. Half of the trafficking victims globally are children. We have only found about 60 children who are victims of trafficking. Now, if this figure holds, that is a serious social problem. In other words, if half of the 14.5 to 18.5 victims coming to the United States on an annual basis are kids, we have only found a tiny, tiny portion of that population. And as you can recognize, kids are going to be the most reluctant to report the crime that's being committed uh, against them. <clears throat> Obviously, uh, a lot of the, the victims uh, who get involved in commercial sex exploitation uh, were also uh, abused uh, as children and um, a large majority uh, beaten by a caregiver prior to uh, getting involved in that, in that business. That really speaks not to the uh, foreign victims who come here and are forced into prostitution unawares, but the large uh, phenomenon of, of runaway and homeless uh, youth that are getting involved in, in commercial uh, sex. 
You know, one of the, one of the really traumatic things in, in this field that we see is the phenomenon of parents selling their kids uh, into trafficking situations, into slavery. Overseas, we've seen kids, seen kids sold into slavery by parents for the price of a television set, really trivial amounts of money. In the United States, by and large, it's not parents selling their kids, it's throwaway kids. It's parents kicking their kids uh, out uh, of the house. And if you've ever seen some of the studies of how long a child remains free when they arrive, say, at Port Authority bus terminal in New York, it's measured in a few hours before a pimp picks them up and they are on the road to uh, commercial sex. The traffickers, because of the big bucks involved, particularly on the commercial sex exploitation side, very sophisticated criminal enterprises. This is why we're seeing such a growth in victims from Eastern Europe, because it's being driven by Russian criminal syndicates. So we have a lot of international criminal syndicate activity. On the labor side, very often, it's small operations. It's uh, kind of an unfortunate phrase, mom and pop operations, where a husband and wife are recruiting back in their home country, bringing people here uh, and uh, subjecting them to, uh, to labor exploitation. Every story of a victim of trafficking is different. A lot of the victims come here full of hope. They're told, hey, it's the land of opportunity. Have I got a deal for you? You're going to have a glamorous job in the entertainment industry. And uh, of course, the, the job that they discover once they get here is, is quite different. Some of them come full of despair. I've told you that victims uh, are sold into slavery by their parents. So some of the victims come here really pretty much aware of what it is that they're going to be subjected to. Some come legally, often they come illegally. Men, women, boys and girls, it's quite a uh, variety. <clears throat> These, this indicates some of the motivations that they're, uh, some of the incentives that they're given by the traffickers. And <clears throat> traffickers are using uh, a lot of uh, sophisticated techniques back in the source countries to recruit their, their victims. Advertising, mail order brides is a big uh, source of uh, victims coming to the United States. <clears throat> so, um, the thing that, that keeps the victims in place, more likely fear than physical bondage. We had what is to date the second largest case of trafficking uh, occur to be detected uh, on Long Island at the end of last year. 80 Peruvian laborers were liberated. And this was an example of the mom and pop shop. Husband and wife team, they basically had one set of documents that they used to bring the victims into the country and then they went back to Peru and used the same documents to bring more. So there's obviously document frauds. But what was so interesting about this case in understanding human trafficking is these victims were kept in a, uh, a safe house, that may be an unfortunate use of the term, at night, kept under lock and key, but they were transported by their traffickers to legitimate places of employment by day. So they worked at legitimate enterprises in construction, commercial nurseries, commercial laundry, those sorts of businesses. The, the proprietors of the businesses had no idea that their laborers were victims of trafficking. The traffickers transported them to the place of employment, picked them up at night, confiscated their paychecks. Some of these victims were in place for two years before they were finally liberated at the end of last year. I think that illustrates, when you think about how often during a typical day a victim had a chance to cry out for help, how often did one of these victims have an opportunity to go to someone and say, can you help me? Here is my situation. And they did not do so. They're afraid of the trafficker and physical harm if they try to escape. They're afraid of us. They're afraid of government officials. They come from countries where the police are not on the side of the most vulnerable. They're unaware that what's being done to them is a crime. They're afraid of what will be done to their families back home. This is what we have to overcome in order to encourage victims um, to, to make a dash for freedom, to try and, and escape 
uh, if we can't rescue them uh, directly. The traffickers, as it says, are using threats of violence. They're isolating the, uh, the victims. They're convincing the victims that if they ask for help, they will be thrown in jail and then deported. They're confiscating the victims' documents and creating a sense that uh, the society at large is a very hostile environment uh, to them. Obviously, there's a whole host of health implications. They're living in inhumane uh, conditions, bad sanitation, obviously inadequate uh, nutrition, poor personal hygiene, abuse, both physical and emotional. They're working in dangerous uh, conditions uh, at work. Some of these, the stories of uh, construction labor, where time is of the essence, are really, uh, really scary. And uh, kids involved in migrant farm labor. Farms, who knew, are extremely dangerous environments, given the chemicals that are used on the produce these days. This is not a place where you want uh, children. Obviously, victims very often present with the, uh, the sort of uh, ailments that you would expect from the commercial sex industry, including HIV, AIDS, and other uh, STDs, physical damage, pregnancies. Um, very often, from the, from the working conditions and the labor exploitation side, you'll see chronic back, hearing, cardiovascular, respiratory problems. The respiratory, again, something we see particularly in farm labor, eye problems. Most of these you can anticipate given the, the, uh, the uh, industries in which they're working. Malnourishment serious dental problems. Uh, sometimes they arrive in the country with diseases that are uncommon in the United States, like tuberculosis or malaria. Very often undetected and untreated diseases. One of the things that gives me hope is that because this is an economic crime, there is a certain incentive for the traffickers to protect their investment by getting some modicum of health care for injured workers or uh, victims who um, encounter disease. And that's why I think that there is an opportunity to identify victims through health care providers. But by and large, a lot of the victims are, are not getting the health care they need. There was a case of a, a woman in domestic servitude. Neighbor thought it was odd that she was aware there was someone living in this house that never came out in public. And uh, the woman had a chance, this neighbor had a chance to see the victim and noticed an enormous tumor. And that was what triggered the neighbor to step in, get the woman health care, and then realize that this was a case of, uh, of human trafficking. Obviously, you'll see signs of uh, physical abuse like uh, bruises and uh, scarring. As Laura mentioned, substance uh, abuse is common and used as a control technique. And, uh, of course, uh, so often a psychological trauma, uh, including traumatic uh, bonding with the, the trafficker. Uh, we have a list of uh, things that are not negative indicators of trafficking, like, for example, the victim uses familial names to refer to the trafficker or shows an emotional attachment to the trafficker. These things do not mean it's not a case of uh, human trafficking, because the psychological trauma is uh, often quite severe. And one of the things my uh, office does is also support centers for the treatment of victims of torture. And we've been in conversations with them about uh, taking some of their expertise in dealing with that very severe form of trauma and uh, helping us understand the trauma that victims of human trafficking encounter, because it very often uh, is the same. So, uh, we have a, uh, a tremendous social problem that is hidden in plain sight. That's the other lesson of the Long Island case. If only the people on the other side recognized there was a problem, we could have liberated these victims earlier. In the end, it was an intermediary. It was a school counselor who first detected this problem. Because, yes, one of the kids of the victim of trafficking was allowed to go to school. And the victim was, uh, the counselor was the same ethnicity, Peruvian. 
and uh, in talking to the kids was able to, re to realize that there was a serious uh, problem uh, here. So that's why we've launched this uh, campaign to rescue and restore victims of human trafficking. This public awareness campaign is to, to get the word out, to enlist the, the uh, participation of intermediaries uh, in our efforts to find um, the victims. What will a victim sort of look like when they show up in a clinic or an emergency room? Well, very often, particularly in health situations, they are going to be uh, followed by the trafficker. So there's going to be a very controlling individual who tries to prevent the victim from having contact with health care providers. There will be signs of physical abuse. The victim will be tremendously fearful, very reluctant to talk, won't admit to speaking English and probably doesn't, and will have no identification. These are some of the typical signs that victims will, uh, will present when they, they show up in the uh, health care facilities. And therefore, it's important to isolate the victim, uh, preferably without raising suspicions with the trafficker, and uh, in order to protect the, the privacy of the victim and get them in a situation where they're able, perhaps, hopefully, to tell a little bit about their story. And uh, it's very important to enlist translators that are trusted, namely not affiliated with the traffickers. This is a very serious recurring problem. We try to reach out to, tra to translators in these cases, and it turns out that there often are links between translators and, uh, and the traffickers. We want to gain the trust of the victims, assure them of their safety, confidentiality, and, uh, uh, you know, like so many of these uh, situations, to approach our questions uh, with a bit of indirection. Here are some of the questions you could ask that indicate trafficking. Are you able to leave your work or job if you wanted to? Can you come and go as you please? Have you been threatened with harm if you try to quit? Has anyone threatened your family? What are your working li or living conditions like? Where do you eat or sleep? Do you have to ask permission to eat, sleep, or go to the bathroom? Have you ever been kept in a locked room so that you can't get out? Messages to convey to the victims. We're here to help you. Our priority is your safety. We want to give you the medical care you need. We can find you a safe place to stay. This is, uh, you know, one of the great accomplishments, I think, of the implementation of the Act since it passed is that we have a national network of service providers, non-governmental organizations that have stepped forward to help victims of human trafficking. So we really have an excellent system that we can refer victims to and particularly in the, in the case of minors. We enroll minor victims of human trafficking in the Unaccompanied Refugee Minor Program, which is a na nationwide network of uh, different facilities. It can be a group home, it can be foster care, it can be um, uh, facilities with much more intensive uh, staffing. And uh, so we're able to provide the, the minor victim of trafficking the kind of care that they need. So if, if we are able to find them, I really am confident in their case that we can provide a very high level of, uh, of help. We want to make sure that what happened to you doesn't happen to anyone else. You are the victim of crime. You can get help. We can help you rebuild your life while staying in this country. You will not be deported. This is the number one concern of our NGO partners. If we bring a victim forward, are they going to get deported? It's obviously the number one concern of most victims. And the premise of the act, again, is that they should be allowed to rebuild their lives while staying here in the country. We set up a uh, nationwide toll-free hotline, the Trafficking Information Referral Hotline, 888-3737-888. See why we clustered the numbers that way. And uh, this is the one-stop shop, I think, uh, if, you th if you think you've encountered a victim of trafficking because the point is A, to describe the phenomenon of trafficking if it's a, a case you're not sure about, but more importantly to uh, let you know or to put you in direct contact or to put the victim in contact with a service provider in your community that has stepped forward to serve victims of human trafficking. So the, the objective really of this phone number is to get the victim and the, and the NGO linked up during that first call so that the victim can get to a safe place, get stabilized, 
and um, begin the process of restoration. Uh, I mentioned the strategy of the campaign is to uh, uh, reach victims through intermediaries. We are not trying to convey uh, messages to victims directly because we don't know how to do that. We haven't found a systematic way to reach victims of trafficking with our communications messages. So we're reaching out to these organizations, law enforcement, health care providers, social service providers, pro bono attorneys, you know, public defenders, child protective services, juvenile court officials, social service providers in the community, faith community leaders, all of these are examples of intermediaries that potentially are coming in contact with victims on a regular basis. We are enlisting national membership organizations, a few of which are shown here, to get the word out to their membership if the membership includes people that are likely to be encountering victims, obviously. American Medical Association is a, is a wonderful candidate for that. We've prepared a series of resource materials, uh, a small sample of which you have in front of you. All of our materials can be previewed on our website, which has this unfortunate address, but is also in the materials that you have. If you look on the back of the brochure and the bottom of the fact sheets. Uh, so um, I encourage you to um, check out the educational uh, materials that are there, and we would be very happy to provide them in bulk to anybody that can use them. There's an order form on the website. We've gotten 85,000 hits uh, on the website so far. It's about a year old. Let's try that. I don't know that. That's an excellent question. That's an excellent idea. We're working on getting a, uh, a more user-friendly uh, address, too. And it's a, a different but interesting story. The hotline is available 24-7. It, it can handle calls in virtually any language, uh, not necessarily through its internal capabilities, but by getting a uh, translation service on the line, uh, an interpretation service on the line. So we'll handle calls in, in any language. It's available 24-7. In the year that it's been up and running, we've uh, gotten 2,100 calls, which, you know, is pretty modest, I think. But on the other hand, it's generated uh, more than 100 tips that we have forwarded to the Department of Justice about serious potential cases of trafficking. And um, it has resulted in 20% um, referral. That is to say, persons calling to find out what the organization in their community is that's available to help victims. So that's encouraging. I'm confident as a result of that effort that there are many victims that are being helped today that would not otherwise have been helped. I spoke about the grantee uh, victim support network. Both my agency, Health and Human Services, and the Department of Justice are supporting through grants organizations to aid victims of human trafficking. Um, and, and just so we're clear, this is, this is the problem. Since the act was uh, passed, we've certified 717 uh, victims. Certification is done by my department. It's kind of the end point in the process in which we officially recognize somebody as a victim of human trafficking. And the effect of certification is that a, a person is made eligible for virtually every federally funded benefit program like Medicaid, food stamps, TANF, even though the victim is an alien and probably an illegal alien. So it's really a very powerful tool uh, to deploy on behalf of victims. Does it give them status to work legally in the United States? Uh, HHS certification does not, but the, the T visa does. So. Um, Right, there's a, there's a special T. It happens, it, it, coincidentally, it's called the T, capital T, visa, for which victims of human trafficking are eligible. And... Um, so they get, it's actually done first. In the case of adults, typically they, they get uh, immigration relief, which is either the award of the T visa, which they apply for on their own. It's a self... Uh, uh, applied uh, self-application. 
or uh, federal law enforcement issues uh, what's called continued presence. So that's an even faster way of getting immigration relief. Um, in the case of adults, they get immigration relief and then they come for us, to us for services, although our grantees are working with them from the moment of identification. So we have, we have set up a network to, to work with victims but in order for them to really qualify for the full range of benefits, they have to go through this process of, of uh, getting uh, certified. In the case of minors, service precedes any kind of immigration relief. If we find out about a minor, we'll put them in this unaccompanied refugee minor program uh, same day. So things get the services before immigration relief. Okay. David, are you switching tapes? Um, yeah, if you want to wait until I switch to the tape, that'd be fine. I, don't know if it's, what I was saying is repeat the question so we capture it. Um, oh, okay, so, okay. Um, you, can, you can repeat that question and answer that one now, or you can wait until I change the tape either way. I have about six minutes left on the tape. Okay, um, do, I'm sorry, do your question. Give me your question once more. Why are they? because it's attached. English anyway, and secondarily, what would prevent them from getting the visa? All right, well, uh, when Congress passed the Trafficking Victim Protection Act in 2000, there was a lot of concern about this becoming a, a, a source of fraud, a backdoor to uh, immigration relief for people who really didn't deserve it. So there were a couple of uh, safeguards put in place by Congress. One was to limit the number of TVs to 5,000 a year. Well, we are so far from hitting that ceiling. That's a non-factor. The other thing, though, is that they required that uh, adult victims cooperate with law enforcement in the investigation of the trafficker in order to qualify for the full range of, of benefits. Um, the reason that we require an application for the T is that there's really, there's no other mechanism for awarding it. Uh, the visa application is adjudicated by the uh, Citizenship and Immigration Services Branch of Homeland Security, and uh, they don't have an ability to go out and find victims. Uh, so we rely on victims to make themselves known to Homeland Security. This is one of the reasons it's extremely important, in my view, to get the victim into an early partnership with a, um, an organization that will help them, advocate for them, explain how to access benefits, because it is a complicated system. And so uh, our experience has been victims don't do this alone. They don't approach the T visa application or talk to law enforcement by themselves. They should be in the company uh, of, uh, of an advocate. Um, <clears throat> where do you have offices or, I guess if I had a victim, I, I take care of a lot of uh, uh, undocumented immigrants in South Texas, in San Antonio, and we staff tomato clinics, and we staff acute care, facilities where people can walk in. We don't uh, make people show the type of identification that would establish them as a citizen uh, because we, we really don't care. We just care for people's health. So if I had a, a patient, I'm sure I've missed patients that fit into this category, but where would I go to start to get the ball rolling to um, get someone the type of help they need to uh, get out of the trafficking situation and get into, um, get connected with the social services that they're right. eligible. Okay, so the question was, uh, if you suspect a victim, how do you access the, the benefits available to them? Um, you, have a, you have a special case, so the, the general answer is call the hotline. 
I think you have a special case because of the greater likelihood that you are seeing victims on a more regular basis. I, I have no doubt that you're right, that you're encountering victims more frequently than um, uh, health care providers in other parts of the country. Although I, I, I want to emphasize this is a ubiquitous problem. I don't think there is any area of the country that is free from human trafficking. Um, so what we ought to do in your case is establish a relationship now with uh, an NGO that's willing to partner with victims so that you can give the victim a safe place to go today when you en encounter them. And, uh, so there isn't a, like offices that you work through in local areas? No, we, we, uh, we work exclusively through uh, NGOs. We don't work, it's not the, the federal, you know, the federal trafficking program uh, at HHS is uh, here in the room today. Well, there are three other people, but you know, <laughs> no, that's what I'm trying it's, to get there's at. not a network of investigators. We rely on partners. If we go to your website, does it list the NGOs that you've already It, it, it doesn't because there are security issues. So what I would like to do is, is help you solve your problem personally, but in general, Others could call the webs, could call the hotline, and and describe their situation and be given uh, an agency to to work with. Do the NGOs? Let me uh, finish the uh, the presentation and then we do all of our questions uh, together. Sorry. Um, you know the, this. I I love talking to groups and spend a lot of time doing it because I have not had a, an organization that I that I spoke to at least in a large gathering of people <laughs> in which somebody didn't come up afterwards and say I know about a case of trafficking. We go into cities as you're going to see in a moment and launch local anti-trafficking coalitions and we talk to local law enforcement and they say never heard of human trafficking and you explain it to them because they don't know the term and you explain it to them and invariably they say, oh yeah, we got that here. So it is it, this outreach activity that, uh, like what we're doing today, is so important because it always results in cases uh, coming forward. Now as part of the, the Rescue and Restore strategy, we are going to specific targeted cities and building local anti-trafficking coalitions consisting mainly of community organizations and community activists, wide, a wide array of, of partners. And the purpose of these coalitions is to help us really penetrate the community with our messages and our material and to sort of keep a level of activism going in the community on the issue of trafficking. So, so far we have launched in um, 12 cities, Las Vegas, the, the yellow boxes represent cities that we intend to launch in, although in fact we have already done Las Vegas and Minneapolis. The red dots represent the cities where we've already launched our coalitions. And on this chart there are ten of those. You see we're going to get to an additional seven this year and we will keep doing this year in and year out. So part of our strategy was one, work through intermediaries, two, have a city-specific strategy where we're really working to, to drill down uh, within the, the community and, uh, and, and to pursue the techniques more of, of public relations than of advertising. We are doing some paid advertising in this uh, campaign. Non-English media, Spanish and Polish and Russian and Chinese newspapers, but the real heart of it is the um, the, the local activity and when we go into a city after building this anti-trafficking coalition we'll do a launch event a public announcement these events have collectively generated uh, nearly 80 million media impressions which means the potential audience of people who could have seen an article or a broadcast about human trafficking so it's it's having an impact we are building uh, public awareness and uh, those launch events are clearly the, the best thing that we're doing in terms of generating uh, calls to the hotline or um, those kinds of uh, public responses. What can professionals do to uh, help us find victims of trafficking? 
In general, I think you already know the answers. Be aware of the phenomenon, know how to recognize a victim, know what to do when you find one. But in your case, the additional is help us think about how to more effectively collaborate both with the AMA and the healthcare industry in general. We would be thrilled to have, us, have you say to us, look, you know, this little card you've done doesn't work, but here's what would work, and help us design materials that doctors and nurses would actually use. That would be a terrific outcome. So that brings us to questions and answers, and thank you for your patience. Elaine. First of all, that was excellent. Thank you. Um, I work with a number of grassroots organizations, both in domestic violence and sexual assault, and I know how um, dedicated the staff is, how hard they work, and how absolutely strapped they are in terms of funding and um, uh, even office space, uh, confidential space. So as a physician, if I were to call the hotline and connect somebody to an NGO, uh, how are they fund, are they, do they receive specific funding in order to do this, or per case funding, or any kind of additional assistance, or am I going to absolutely um, uh, overwhelm a system that is that already <coughs> been written for, particularly in the area where human service programs are being progressively cut? Uh, between the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Justice's uh, Office of Victims of Crime, we have funded um, about 35 organizations to provide direct services to victims. So in, in many communities, there is an entity that is, has been funded through a grant to help victims of trafficking. In addition, we have a, a grantee that we call the Anytime Anywhere Grant, which uh, will step in when a victim is found in an area where there's not another grantee. So we do have national coverage for adults, for kids. Uh, uh, we have this wonderful system that is nationwide unaccompanied refugee minor uh, system. There is a certain inefficiency in, the, in using grants to fund this. And uh, the inefficiency is that we, we're making awards to organizations that may never see a victim of trafficking. So what we're looking at doing is creating a, uh, a per capita service uh, benefit so that any entity that encounters a victim could apply for some help. And it, you know, it won't be a huge amount. We, we, we're work, we don't know what the amount will be, but you know, maybe a thousand a month per victim so that our money starts to follow the victim and not the organization. Having said that, I'm not eager for organizations that have no background in human trafficking you know, to, to start serving victims without getting up to speed. I think it is a kind of